Hi, I'm Martin Mendel, and I'm the director for the value creation through innovation specialization given by EIG Digital. Welcome to the second out of two courses in innovation entrepreneurship given by Haas School of Business here at UC Berkeley. For those of you following the EIT Digital Specialization, this is the third out of the four courses included. In the last course, Innovation Entrepreneurship from Basic to Open Innovation, you were introduced to the basics of innovation and entrepreneurship, followed by market analysis and how to engage with customers, and finally Open Innovation was covered. I hope you learned a lot and that the course met your expectations. And for those of you that do not yet follow the specialization, please consider to join the specialization starting with the course, The Impact of Technology. In this course, we will start with design thinking, followed by business modeling, and finally cover how to finance a new venture. Professor Andrew Isaacs is the program director for this course and will, together with his colleagues, guide you through these exciting topics. I hope you will enjoy the course. Welcome back. My name is Andrew Isaacs. I'm the faculty director for this program, and it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Clark Kellogg's lecture to you. A couple of thoughts before we get started, and things that I'd like to ask you to pay attention to in Professor Kellogg's lecture that follows. First of all, he defines something that's really central to this entire sequence of lectures, and that's the concept of what is innovation. Innovation has become something of a buzzword in the sense that it's commonly used. To really be serious about innovation, we need to define what we're doing and we need to be able to measure the outcome of what we're doing. So pay close attention to how innovation is defined at the beginning of, this, uh, of the lecture that follows. Pay close attention also to how the design process is described. Design is another, something of a buzzword, I suppose. It's a word that's commonly used in a lot of different ways, often without much definition. As a result, many people hear the word design or design thinking, and they think it's sort of soft and amorphous and poorly defined, but in fact, there's a real structure to the process of design thinking, and it's laid out in clear detail in the lecture that follows. So please play, pay close attention to the structure around design thinking. Finally, as you enjoy this course by Professor Kellogg, the lecture that follows, think about how you will need to go about modifying the structured design, uh, design thinking process. In other words, for the business that you're actually in and for the problems that you're trying to solve, how you can modify, adapt, and make your own the process of design thinking. I hope you enjoy the lecture that follows. Hello, my name is Clark Kellogg. I am from the University of California at Berkeley in the Haas School of Business. Today I'd like to talk to you about innovation. And to begin, ask the question, why is innovation on everyone's mind right now? After all, we've been innovating for thousands and thousands of years. But there is something different in the world today. Innovation is not just a happenstance response to a a found need among a group of people, it's become a knowable, learnable, teachable, disciplined process. And I want to talk about that process with you right now. A little history lesson. This image, I doubt you would recognize it, it's the first working prototype of a transistor. 
created in 1948. Not many years later, right here in Silicon Valley, the first commercial transistor was made available in 1962. Of course, you know what this began. It began the revolution that has become the digital age. This image of information moving across the internet might look suspiciously like the human brain. Well, it was modeled after the human brain, and that's no coincidence. But this took us forward into a networked world that we now live in, where the old equations of problem solving, of business, and of value are being questioned. In the old days, we did things a little bit differently. Today, I want to talk to you about the definition of design thinking and the definition of innovation. The image on your screen about design thinking, we laugh and say it's a bad name for a good idea. It's based on powerful insights that we've been working with for almost 30 years now. The way that designers approach and understand and solve complex problems can be used in other ways in business. I'm an architect by original training, and I spent time mapping these tools to other disciplines, in this case, the discipline of business. Now I'd like to talk to you about innovation. And innovation also is not new. Remember fire. What is new is the power of innovation to drive and propel organizations to sustained performance and growth. At its core, innovation helps us to do three things. Discover what others haven't seen. Design solutions like products, services, processes, and even businesses. And then to deliver them to the people for whom they meet a need or add value. We used to go about designing and solving problems like this. A fairly ambiguous problem where you start off in one end, designers do something magical, and you get a product on the other side. But now things are quite different. The problems are more complicated. In fact, the closer you get to them, the more complicated they become. So what are we to do? Well, one of the things we're learning how to do is to understand the questions before we try to find the answers. By this I mean sometimes we are so close in, we look at something through the straw, not through the wide lens. And when we step back and try to look at a problem differently, we see it in a whole different light. In fact, this idea of the question is so important and so powerful that I'd like to spend a little bit of time on it. Humans are terrific problem solvers. We often solve the wrong question, however. We're so quick to rush to the solution that we forget to think more deeply about what is the problem. So we have a discipline of asking why many, many times, of reframing, of finding the true nature of the problem. So when you work with innovation people or design thinking people, you'll find us often asking this powerful, simple question, why? And in the course of doing that, we find that we land on a much deeper, more powerful, more insightful question, and then we set about to solve it. And that solving of the right question yields the right answer. The quality of all of this work, therefore, goes up, and it allows us to begin solving the much more complex problems of today's interconnected world that we're all living in. Some of these problems are big, global warming. Some are small. All of them are able to be worked on using the innovation process and the mental tools of design thinking. So having spoken about the nature of questions and solutions, I'd like to show you a short film about design thinking and some of the people that are using it in a varied uh, type of disciplines and, and different settings. I make stuff up. Okay. <laughs> Look at what's happening now. There have been fundamental changes in the way uh, people think about problems, the kinds of problems that occur, and certainly the impact on design. 
Now, my definition of design thinking is applying the methodologies and approaches of design to a broader set of issues and problems in business and society. So many people think that it's kind of like in your genes. You're a creative person or you're not. I don't buy that. Prototyping, testing, failing all the time, but failing quickly and cheaply in order to succeed. A big part of it with city governments is just getting them comfortable with the idea of experimentation. It's totally antithetical to the culture of startups in Silicon Valley. Try something if it doesn't work, throw it out and start again. Now, when the government came to us and asked us to redesign the ballot, we said we wouldn't redesign the ballot. But what we would do is redesign the election experience. If I didn't have to just pick a boring, ugly bike <laughs> pre-built off the shelf, if I got to choose the color of the frame, the color of the wheels, what would my bike look like? I think it was called the Flower Power was the internal name for one of the iMacs. And it wasn't a success. It lasted in the marketplace for six months. Some people are saying, oh, I hate the word design thinking. If you're only thinking, then you're not doing. Some of the aspects of design thinking are simply suggesting that designers are not thinking. It doesn't matter what the problem is, I can go in and solve it because I'm a designer. I once had a guy come to me and literally say, it ain't show art, kid. You know, it's show business. Why is it that big, huge corporations get beaten by kids in garages? The thing that excites me the most about this, and I think it excites most people, is we have a chance to really move the needle. We have a chance to make a difference on a significant level when we get all these pieces moving together. That's what gets me up every day. So as we talk about design thinking in these expanded uses, I want to share with you some insight from the director of uh, the MIT Media Lab, Joy Ito, and reflecting on the landscape of problems and solutions today, he proposed several frameworks for our thinking and for the challenges we face. I'm going to go over just a few of them. The first one is resilience over strength. Our practice today is to learn by doing to see what happens when we take action and then adjust. We call this iterating or pivoting. And this is at the heart of the difference between having to know the answer and implementing it no matter what and learning our way forward into new, select, new solutions and discovering new possibilities. The second is risk over safety. The fact is there's no safe place these days and the riskiest thing a company or an individual can do is try to find that safe harbor. It's too risky to try to be safe. The next is disobedience over compliance. And by this we mean not go out and get arrested. We mean that in terms of thinking, it's the disobedient thinker, the one who questions the status quo, who seeks new answers and a higher level of question that we're talking about. Someone once said to me, no one ever won a Nobel Prize by being compliant. And I think that's true. This one is emergence over authority. This is certainly the story of the networked world, isn't it? The emergence of new technology, of new people, of new economies, of new regions, of new influence. Authority is the force of the status quo. Emergence is the force of questioning the status quo and looking for the new answers, the new horizons. The last I want to talk about is learning over education. By this, I mean, it's a good, I teach at a university, it's a good thing to get a college degree. But more important than the piece of paper on the wall is the learning in your mind. So learning is taking place in all kinds of different settings than we have traditionally thought about it. 
So our emphasis in innovation and design thinking on learning is to suggest that we can learn from everywhere, not just in a classroom, even my classroom. So this discussion about ideas and frameworks of problem solving in the 21st century brings us to a different question. What might we do? Is the answer do nothing? Well, of course it isn't do nothing. Instead, it is to find the source of new tools and new ways of thinking. And for that, I would like to introduce you to the greatest tool for this work that exists. By the way, you all have one. It weighs about 11 pounds. You carry it with you wherever you go. It is our brains. The construct of brain research is changing, but there's a wide sense of the brain having a left half and a right half, or left-brained and right-brained. When we come back, I want to take you deeper into the brain and have the left and right halves of the brain introduce themselves to you. the left brain and the right brain. Let's have the left brain introduce itself to you. I am the left brain. I am a scientist, a mathematician. I can categorize, I am accurate, I am linear. I love the familiar. I'm always in control. I am a master of words and language. I am order, I am logic, and I know exactly who I am. The right brain pops up and says, I am the right brain. I am creativity, a free spirit. I am passion, yearning, sensuality. I'm the sound of laughter. I'm tasty. I am movement. I am vivid colors, the urge to paint on an empty canvas. I am boundless imagination, art, poetry. I sense, I feel, I'm everything I want to be. Now, the Industrial Revolution and its great success has mostly been built on our left brain capabilities, linearity, repeatability, perfection. The only problem is that the natural resources which have fueled the Industrial Revolution are running out of supply. Not only that, the world's problems have changed and they're a little bit different. So now we're looking for the new tools, the other half of the brain, that can help us approach problems and solutions with creativity, with passion, with insight, and with laughter. The right brain wants to continue its introduction. Well, go ahead. I synthesize information in new ways, it says, and so it does. You know, in 1776, the year that my country was founded, a person living in London would experience in their whole lifetime the same amount of information that you would encounter in the Sunday edition of the New York Times today. The capacity to synthesize information in new ways is the capacity to see things differently, to connect the dots differently, and understand new pathways to new ideas. I am comfortable with ambiguity, the right brain tells us. Ambiguity gives us the capacity to be in that messy problem learning and problem solving phase where we don't know the answers, where everything is incomplete. We don't have enough information to solve the problem. All we have are mm, complication and not much insight. We often say the road to simplicity travels through complexity. And in order to make that journey, one must be comfortable with ambiguity. The right brain goes on, I think, with words and pictures. A big emphasis in the design thinking world around visual literacy, drawing. Drawing ignites a different, the frontal lobe of your brain. And it's a different source of ideas, energy, and visualization. In other words, a different language, more ideas, more insight. I reframe the question. 
By this we mean we look at the question and we wonder, is this the right one? I spoke briefly about this earlier. The right brain skill of reframing, of saying, hmm, what about this? Is the thing we count on to be able to see things a little bit differently. The next right brain skill says, I prototype, I test, I learn from failure. Now, failure is failure, but learning from failure, trying something, seeing what happens, incorporating that into the next thing we do, is the essence of what we call learning from failure. It's really learning from trying something. And when we incorporate what we've just learned into the next step, the next piece of the experiment, we're doing exactly what I'm talking about here. I prototype, I test, I learn from everything I do. Failure in this case. This next skill of the right brain, I create multiple solutions. You know, if all you have is a hammer, everything must look like a nail. In creating multiple solutions, we have many more options that people can work with, co-create with, improve. And we move away from this terribly corrosive notion of idea infatuation. It's my idea. It has to be good. It can't be changed. This next is I collaborate. Collaboration, we all talk about it. We think we know what we're doing. I don't claim to know what, what I'm doing around absolute collaboration. So I'm going to show you a quick 40-second film about collaboration. And it's a metaphoric film, but you'll understand what I'm talking about. Take a look. So what did you notice in this film? Well, first of all, it's well choreographed, isn't it? That train runs through the marketplace 22 times a day. No one's ever been hurt. Why might that be? Well, everyone knows their role, they've rehearsed it, and they execute it flawlessly. The train driver knows to slow down and toot the, the uh, horn of the train. The people in the food stalls know to move their goods and carts to the side. The shoppers hear the train, see the movement, they step aside too. And as soon as the train passes by, what happens? Everyone in their role with their expertise comes back together, reassembles the market. It takes about four seconds. This metaphor of collaboration is my favorite because it shows that everyone doesn't have to do everything. They don't have to be the smartest person in the room. They have to contribute their skills and their talents, their timing and their sequence. And we use this idea in creating collaboration among teams, young and old, in companies, in schools. Now I want to move on to another of the right brain skills. I think and I do. This is the essence of the design mind and the right brain skill of creating. You know, we make things up twice when you think about this in our minds. The first time we think something up in our imaginations, the first creation. And then we make it in the real world, in the second creation. And it is in the doing that we revise our thinking. This is this learning module again. We'll go on. Right brain says, I create new stories. This is an essential capacity. Imagine if President John Kennedy had said, uh, I don't know what we're going to do for the next decade. Uh, maybe something to the moon. He didn't say that, did he? He said, I believe that in this decade, 
We will send a man to the moon and bring him back alive. Which set in motion this new story, this intention of the future. Look at the power of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King. I have a dream. And that dream, that new story, has created a legacy of generations of social justice. So the idea of creating new narratives, imagine a world in which, is a key skill of our right brain suite of tools. The last one is the story of optimism. The right brain is the source of hope, of inspiration, and of intention. And so it's true that the design thinking brain says, I believe I can make the world a better place. So who am I, this right brain that's been talking to us? I'm a design thinker. And with practice, you'll be one too. I'd like to end with one quote and a short film. This quote is by Alan Kay, a pioneer of Silicon Valley. Alan was the man who essentially invented the mouse and the human uh, computer interface that Apple made famous in its operating system. But Alan says this, the best way to predict the future is to design it. And that certainly is the role of design thinking in the world today. I promised you I would end with a film. I'm going to launch that film now. It's a short film about intention, about creating new narratives for the future. Let me play it. What we have before us are some breathtaking opportunities, disguised as insoluble problems. In our next segment, we'll talk about the actual process of innovation and break it down into its four different parts and talk about how we develop the tools to become good at using them. In this section, I want to talk about the actual process we use to run the innovation cycle. And it's divided into four quadrants. We call it the Haas innovation process, a learning method. We emphasize the learning method piece because this is a way for an innovation team to get smarter and smarter as they go through the process, to learn more and more about the questions and the potential solutions to whatever problem an organization might be working on. And just parenthetically, we use this process to work on things as simple and mundane as how to stack dishes in a store, up to things as complicated and critical as how to reduce the number of armed nuclear missiles in the world today. In each of those cases, we're using the process I'm going to describe to you now. Of course, complexity levels vary, and the number of people working on them varies. But the process is always the same. So we begin with these four quadrants that you see on the screen. And the first step begins in the lower left-hand corner. It's called the understand and observation phase. In this phase, we talk to people, we observe what they do, we listen to their issues and problems, and we often shadow them around in their day 
so we understand not only what they're saying, but what they're doing. We also gather information and data from all kinds of qualitative sources. With all of this in hand, we move to the second phase of the process, or the insight phase. Here, we're organizing, synthesizing, and understanding all of the data we've gathered in phase one. From this, we gather what we call insights. These are new ideas that we didn't know about before, but they're new ideas about the things that we've all seen. This is often described as connecting the dots in different ways. The insight phase gives us new views into a particular issue and allows us to ask the fundamental question of what we're doing at that phase. So the first half of our process, we call it problem finding. And then with the problem well stated, we go into the third phase, which we call the ideation phase. In the ideation phase, we are generating lots and lots and lots of potential solutions to this, the question that we have evolved in the first half of the process. We call this diverging and converging. The famous Nobel Prize winning scientist Linus Pauling said it well for us. The way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. So in our ideation phase, we have lots of techniques and tools to generate many, many ideas. And then we converge down to choosing the most promising. In a later segment, we'll talk in more depth about the actual processes of divergence and convergence. But before that, let's complete the innovation cycle and visit the fourth segment, or the experimentation segment. Here, we're taking potentially useful or good solutions, and we're prototyping them, we're experimenting with them, maybe we're telling those innovation stories with them. We're testing them out in many different ways, through prototype, through story, through business model canvases, all of these things we regard as prototypes and experiments. From them and the feedback they generate, we continue to learn through the learning cycle and improve our potential solutions to the problems that we have identified. So the learning process, the innovation cycle, is first, observation, second, insight, third, ideation, and fourth, experimentation. Let's talk about the people that are using this process. And I want to talk about this in terms of learning styles, only to say that all of us have different strengths and weaknesses, and it's important to understand an innovation team's strengths as well as weaknesses, so that we know when to have individuals on the team perform certain functions, certain parts of the innovation cycle. I'm going to show you a film in just a minute that describes these different styles and how they might be used in an effective innovation team. But to set this up, in the four quadrants of the innovation process that we just talked about, we have four quadrants of learning styles. Diverging, assimilating, converging, and accommodating. So take a listen to this film and imagine where you might fit into this cycle as you listen and watch. How do we learn, innovate, tell a story? They're all connected. The Divergent Learner 
Strong feelings orientation. Often introverted, has broad cultural interests, loves art, history, and psychology. This learning style is ideal for the observation phase of the innovation process. They can link with people and with great care and understanding see what their needs are and understand the context of how they use an item or a service. Ethnography and other observation techniques will be used to establish the surroundings, language, character, culture, and history to provide a basis of meaning for all the observed activities of the user. These observations may be captured in the AEIOU format. Activities, environments, interactions, objects, and users. Enter the assimilating learner. They can absorb and process more data than any other learning style. They like to take the data, process it, find patterns, and put it in a usable format that makes sense. This is the person that doodles graphs and charts during business meetings. They are often introverted, intuitive, and love mathematics and the physical sciences. Their biggest contribution to the team is organizing the data from the observation phase, which constitutes the frameworks portion of the innovation process. The converging learning style is best at finding good uses for ideas and theories. Like a compass, they help the team discern which path they should take given all the available options. They are often extroverted thinkers and find their ways into engineering, medicine, in technology fields. They best fit in the imperative stage of innovation. This is where a direction must be set for the project and clear objectives established for the team to follow. Objectives like a laser quality printer that prints on plain paper for under $1,000. The imperative stage requires a different kind of leadership than the previous two stages. It can be full of conflict as many people want to continue gathering and analyzing data or they may not agree on the exact objectives selected. They may want to have a color printer for $1,500, or perhaps the printer should also be a copier. The converging leader must steer the team through these conflicts and provide a clear value proposition for the organization. The accommodating learning style is the fourth and final learning style. They are hands-on, act-from-the-gut kind of people. They score high typically on extroverted and sensing scales in the Meyer Briggs. They are just the people you want leading the solutions phase of the innovation process. Here, they can lead the team to brainstorm, generate concepts, and test those concepts until a final solution for the problem is resolved. It's important to note that the innovation team should include all four learning styles that travel through each of the four phases of the innovation process. Even though some team members will have stronger tendencies in some areas than others, each person can develop in each area of these learning styles, developing not only a better solution for this project, but developing better innovators for future projects. If you would like to learn more about this topic, please reference the California Management Review article Innovation is a Learning Process, Embedding Design Thinking by Sarah L. Beckman and Michael Berry. In our last segment, we walked through the entire four phases of the innovation process. In this segment, and the following three, we're going to zoom in on each one of those four phases and go into a little more detail about what they are, how they work, and how we operate within them. Our first one is the observation phase. In our process diagram, it looks like this. We talked about how observation and ethnographic research are the main tools in this phase. We accomplish this by using three different activities. We ask questions, we watch people, 
and we engage them in meaningful, open-ended conversation about their needs, their work, and the potential use of any product or service we might be imagining. Now, lots of people use this process. I'd like to share, you, share with you the story of one such company, Procter & Gamble. Here is A.G. Laffley, the chairman and CEO of Procter & Gamble. He retired in 2010, but he was asked to come back to the helm of the company to continue driving it forward using some of these processes that we call observation. As you can see, he had a pretty good track record at the helm of the largest consumer product company in the world. How does A.G. Laffley use observation? He spends up to three or four months a year in the field, traveling around the world, talking with customers, going shopping with them, sitting in their kitchens, watching them cook or clean. Now, Procter & Gamble's products are for household use, as you know. If this was the chairman of Ford, he would be driving with people, parking with them, going to the DMV, getting their cars repaired, etc. A.G. Laffley visits with people all around the world. He frequently asks people questions about the products that they're using that are not Procter & Gamble products. And even back at corporate headquarters in Cincinnati, Laffley uses observation and listening as key management tools. But Procter & Gamble isn't the only company that's using these processes. As you can see from the logos on the screen, there are similar large companies and small companies from very different industries, all using the processes of observation to better understand the needs of their customers and how they're using their products or not using their products, as the case may be. This idea of observation was best said in a very old quote. I'll put it up onto the screen now. The task is not so much to see what no one else has seen, but to think what no one else has thought about what everybody sees. This, of course, brings us to a question. How do we see? We all are products of our culture, our age, our generation, our gender, our socioeconomics, where we live, the language we speak. Oftentimes, we don't have a big awareness about the things we take for granted or the ideas that we never challenge. We take them as articles of faith. The notion of understanding the water we're swimming in is an important part of being able to observe in the field with objectivity and compassion and curiosity. There's an old joke about two fish swimming in the water, and they're passed by an older fish going in the other direction. The old fish says to the two young fish, so boys, how's the water today? A few moments later, one of the young fish turns to the other one and says, what the hell is water? The idea of that story is that we often don't understand the way we see, so that when we are looking and observing, we fill in with our own biases. And so we need to develop careful habits of mind to observe with the eyes of a beginner, of almost the child. 